All right, good afternoon, everyone. We have opened up the webinar. We have attendees joining now, and we have some people in CLAP finding some seats, so we'll get started in just a few minutes. All right, I see a few more people coming in, so we'll just wait another moment. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the 2022 Ambrose Gerald Jr. Lecture. Uh, before we get started, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. So for the people who are in the room, there are restrooms downstairs and to your left. For the people who are online, you are muted and we cannot see you. Your cameras will be off for the duration of the program. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A box. And at the end of the program, we do have a lot of time um, for questions and answers. For those people who are in the room, if you have questions, just raise your hand and I will bring you a microphone so that way the people who are online can hear you. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Ann Sylvester, the Director of Research at the Marine Biological Laboratory. Her role is to oversee the research enterprise through short and long-term strategic planning. And Dr. Sylvester came to the MBO recently, but previously she served as Program Director at the National Science Foundation in the Directorate of Biological Sciences. So Dr. Sylvester. Thank you, Anjale, and thank you all of you who are here in the room and those of you who are online for joining us today for the 2022 Ambrose Gerald Jr. Lecture. I have several introductions to make, but first I want to especially welcome Ambrose Gerald who has joined us and is here and his wife. Thank you for joining us today. Um, secondly, we have a, uh, an honored guest, from, uh, the Vice Provost from the University of Chicago. Uh, Dr. Waldo Johnson, Jr., and thank you so much for joining us today. We've had a wonderful uh, visit with you so far. So I, I also want to introduce uh, the Woods Hole Diversity Initiative that is really the foundation for this talk and for supporting uh, the great diversity initiatives that are in the Woods Hole area. So the uh, Woods Hole Diversity Initiative began in 2004 when the leaders of all six of the Woods Hole institutions got together, recognized the great need to increase diversity and equity in the Woods Hole region and signed an MOU to achieve that. So about 18 years later, as we are today, there have been a number of uh, really wonderful initiatives. I've been very impressed since I've come here from the National Science Foundation to see the energy, the enthusiasm, and the progress that has been made. And one big event was the honoring of Dr. Ambrose Gerald in this lecture series. So this lecture series uh, started in 2016 when Dr. Gerald retired. The first lecture, as I understand it, was in 2017. Dr. Gerald was a professor and scientist here in the Woods Hole area uh, where he worked as a fisheries biologist for NOAA for 40 years, for quite some time, a role model and um, a true inspiration to many who worked here. Uh, the purpose of this lecture is to keep us thinking and moving in the direction, the pathway that he and others have laid out for us so that we are no longer 
uh, buried in our own, um, our own selves and we're being diverse and open to the world. The other introduction I'd like to make um, is now to Angela Scott Price, who is also a role model and inspiration to many of us. Um, Anjali will be introducing our speaker today, uh, Dr. Taylor, but I want to tell you a little bit about Anjali because she is also one of the you know, examples of how this area is so productive and, and uh, built on a foundation of devotion to diversity and inclusion. So Anjali uh, came in 2011 as the program coordinator for the Partnership Education Program, the PEP program, which I have come to know and fully appreciate. Um, she's now become the co-director as of 2021. Um, she's really a long-standing member of the Diversity um, Advisory Committee to the Woods Hole Diversity Initiative. And um, she leads many initiatives, including the Black History Month Committee. Uh, she's really been a major force of action, I think we will all agree, for, for moving forward. In 2018, she was the recipient of the John K. Bullard Diversity Award. Um, she also produced, which I looked at recently, an amazing um, set of interviews with Reverend Will Melbane called The Conversation. And I really recommend that you look up this, uh, this uh, conversation. It's, it's a timely dialogue on race um, with a very local focus, so you can get a sense of Woods Hole. Um, she was elected to the Falmouth um, Select Board last year, and she is also COO of an imaging company here on the MBL campus, Mizar Imaging. So I want to take this opportunity to thank Anje for her work and her inspiration, and she will introduce our speaker, Dr. Taylor. So thank you. Well, again, I'm really excited that we are all here today. I'm also very excited this year to again be the chair of the Ambrose Gerald Jr. Lecture because Dr. Gerald has been my mentor for many, many years. He has become family. Um, he is the reason that I came to Woods Hole in 2011. He brought me here to be the coordinator of PEP, so you all have him to thank for me being here, falling in love with Woods Hole and coming back. And it's not often that we have the honor of being able to honor someone while they're still with us. And so I think it's an extra special pleasure that not only is Dr. Gerald still with us, but he's able to join us today for this lecture. And so with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Orlando Taylor. Although I haven't met Dr. Taylor in person yet, I've got to spend a lot of time with him on Zoom and on the phone planning this lecture, and I can say he is a delight, and I'm really excited about what he's gonna share with us today. So Dr. Taylor currently serves as a distinguished senior advisor to the president of Fielding Graduate University. He previously served as president for strategic initiatives and research at Fielding, where he was also principal investigator and director for an NSF-funded grant to advance women in the STEM fields into leadership positions at the nation's historically black colleges and universities and at tribal colleges. He's also served in leadership positions at Howard University and the Washington DC campus of the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. He has earned numerous NSF and other awards focused on diversifying the STEM fields. Dr. Taylor is a national leader and advocate on issues pertaining to diversity and inclusion in higher education, and we're excited to have him share his knowledge and wisdom with us today. So now I will pass it to you, Dr. Taylor. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction. And I must say before I get started, it's really an exceedingly great honor to, to give the uh, lecture today honoring Ambrose Geralds, who's really a, a legend in his own time. And I want to, before I go further, I want to also thank um, uh, Ms. Scott Price for her support and encouragement and, and uh, organization for this lecture this afternoon. She's been absolutely wonderful, and I want to thank her publicly as well. It's a real honor to give the Ambrose Geralds lecture this year not only because I have, I've known Ambrose Geralds for more years than I will admit to, but also because I've been following in the tradition of a number of other great scientists, thinking particularly of Warren Washington, who had a very important role to play with some work we did at Howard University a few years back when we established uh, a new PhD program in atmospheric science. I was also on the board of NCAR or a UCAR rather for several years and I had a chance to see one uh, at least once a year. And so to be able to give a lecture uh, in the same space where he, uh, where Warren Washington is also spoken is also a special honor. In addition to the other speakers over the years. 
But first, the word about our honoree, the person for whom this lecture is named. Uh, you're actually looking at a, a legend in his own time, uh, Ambrose Geralds, who is an alum of the University of Maryland Eastern Shore in Maryland, which is nearby where I am. I'm physically in Washington, D.C. at the moment. Uh, he was an alum in, in 1967 and later at Oklahoma State University where he earned his PhD, 1975. For those of you who do not know a lot about Dr. Geralds, I'm going to say a few things about him and um, to give a little bit of context. He had early stints at Lawrence Livermore and Sandy Hook. He was among the, among the first black fisheries biologists at North and from 1976 through 2016. And he was a former professor at two historically black colleges and universities, Lincoln University in Pennsylvania and Howard University where I spent several decades as well. So that's another important aspect of his legacy. He's provided support, not only in the United States, but also uh, uh, around the world. He provided support for Sea Fisheries South Africa to develop and implement their strategic plan. He led NOAA's technical support for six African countries around the Gulf of Guinea. And he's headed the Woods Hole Academic Program since 2004. And he headed them from 2004 to 2016 and was the first chair of the Woods Hole Diversity Advisory Committee. He co-founded the program that's related to our our uh, program here today. Uh, he co-founded the Partnership Education Program, the PE, PEP program to recruit persons of color at the undergraduate level with interest in marine and environmental sciences. So it's really quite an honor to be able to uh, give the lecture today. I met Dr. Gerald sometime in the 1990s, actually uh, at his alma mater. I met you, at, as I recall, Dr. Gerald, uh, in around 1996 or seven, on the campus of the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. My memory may be slightly off, but I think it's around that time. And it's interesting, as I think about the times I've actually physically seen him since, it's always been in the context of something related to advancing students. I've seen him at national meetings. I've seen him in smaller meetings. And he's always been about the business of recruiting, motivating, retaining, encouraging, supporting students to pursue their dreams and to pursue careers in science. So he is truly a legend in his own time. I'm giving this lecture today at a time where we often talk about new people and new questions and new tools. Science is ever-changing, we all know that. There are new discoveries, new solutions to old and new societal problems. There are technological advances. They've always been a part of our, of our lives. Technological advances have always undergirded discovery from microscopes to computers. And today's information technology, which I'll talk about in just a little bit, has advanced and has actually enhanced and facilitated scientific discovery in ways never before known to humankind. If you think about the, the uh, warp speed that produced the COVID vaccines in, in less than a year, aided by an international, what I'll call supply chain discovery group, it's really quite remarkable from start to delivery inside of a year to address this uh, major pandemic. But moreover, there have always been complex questions that science has attempted to address and from COVID, from to global warming, to climate change, and so on. These questions have led to more and different kinds of people doing and disseminating research. And I'll talk a little bit about different kinds of people. And I'll talk about new people, people who are new on the scene, or people who at the time of their work really were not known before, but, but contributed significantly to advancing our knowledge. And much of this has been aided with uh, information technology advances, uh, uh, with scientists working across uh, political and geographical borders and in real time. So that's been the nature of our discovery for the better part of, of, of the 20th and 21st centuries. Now, 
I want to now go to just taking us back in history a little bit. We're talking about all of these technological changes, but if you, many of you in the room probably recognize <laughs> that modern device, something that some of us, including myself, were very proud to own. This was a, a, the Mac, the early version of the Mac, which, which, which came out initially in 1984. And we thought it was quite something. It actually uh, had, uh, as I recall, something on the order of uh, five, 512 for the fat Mac anyway. Uh, we was called that the, the early editions had 124 uh, 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 Rams, 512. Today, 30 years later, slightly less than 30 years later, we're talking about basic Mac with eight gigabytes of memory which is 62,500, 62,500 times greater than the original Mac. And you can get an upgrade to the 32 gig, uh, which is four times greater than the eight, the basic model. This is all in 30 years. And so you can see this rapid change of technology that has, a great, has greatly impacted our ability uh, to advance science. So indeed, new technologies have advanced our work. Modern computers, supercomputers, and the creation of the internet and other electronic information delivery systems have advanced the speed and capacity for processing, retrieving, storing, and disseminating information far beyond previous imagination. And by the way, we're not talking anymore about gigabytes. We're talking, for example, about zettabytes, which is a trillion gigabytes. So the information chain, information age rather, has clearly changed our planet institutions to new ways of knowing. Computers help to help us to process 80 trillion bytes of data to assemble the human genome. Uh, computer models of Earth systems have advanced our knowledge about the climate and global warming. Information technology, including virtual reality technology, has dramatically changed research in all types of settings and advanced interdisciplinary, interorganizational and international research across domestics and global boundaries. The topic of underrepresentation in STEM is often discussed. It's, but it should always be discussed within the context of the changing uh, national and global economies. According, for example, to a 2020 report, STEM and related fields support two-thirds of U.S. jobs, about 67 percent, and 69 percent of the U.S. GDP related to the STEM fields. They generate $2.3 trillion in annual federal tax revenue, for example, and one-third of U.S. workers are direct STEM professionals. Thus, it's obvious to make the statement that the U.S. requires a well-prepared workforce and a college university faculty to support it, uh, to prepare it in the areas of STEM. And it means further that it must, all of us and all institutions of higher learning, of course, must seek participation in all segments of society. The intellectual capital in STEM within a nation's citizenry is not only an invaluable resource, but a necessity for achieving and sustaining competitiveness in the global community. Also, there are many scientific questions, particularly in the life sciences, uh, 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 and need, that need to be addressed, must be addressed through what we call a socio-cultural lens. In sum, no nation, including our own, can afford to undereducate, uh, underprepare any segment of its population in STEM if it's going to be globally competitive. And we really do need to keep that notion in front of us. And in fact, if we look at the data, the gap between the US and other countries is narrowing with regard to STEM leadership. Well, for example, the US has historically led the world in scientific publications, but China, for example, is rapidly closing the gap. Nature, reported in 2020, for example, that the U.S. share of scientific publications had declined 
by 4.2% in recent years, while China's incre has increased by 15.4%. It's a stunning uh, statistic. The United States, in short, will be unable to maintain its global leadership in STEM unless it significantly increases the participation of women and underrepresented minorities in STEM. And programs like the Partnership Education Program are essential, uh, which means, of course, that Ambrose Gerald's DEI vision many years ago and, and his energy at Woods Hole are exemplars of leadership that must be re replicated throughout the STEM enter enterprise. But a storm is gathering. I was a part of a, of a group that um, met sometime around 2006, headed by Charles, late Charles Vest, who was president at MIT at the time, Shirley Jackson, who was at the time at, R, at Rensselaer, RPI, and, and a, a report was presented called The Gathering Storm. The Gathering Storm. The Gathering Storm spoke about the fact that while the United States has relied heavily and historically on male, white, and international STEM talent, that was beginning to decline for a number of reasons. Number one, more international STEM talent is staying at home to uh, to pursue science. Moreover, there is a rising competition for international STEM talent in Europe, in Australia, and Canada, for example. And at the same time, men are a declining percent of the U.S. college student population. Only 42% of students today in America's colleges and universities, U.S. colleges and universities, are men. Women, obviously, uh, constituting about 57% of today's college university students, and people of color about 40% of today's student population. Yet both groups, both groups, women in general across all racial and ethnic groups, and people of color are significantly, continue to be significantly underrepresented in STEM, especially at the doctoral level, where much of the personnel comes from that, that uh, drives a discovery and innovation. No nation, no nation, I said this before, can afford to undereducate or underprepare any segment of its population if it intends to remain competitive in science. And this intellectual capital in STEM within a nation's citizenry is an invaluable resource and a necessary resource for achieving and sustaining global competitiveness. In addition, many scientific questions, particularly in the life sciences, need to be addressed through a social cultural lens. So this really contextualizes the significance of our work, of the work that you're doing at Woods Hole. It's more than about social justice. While social justice is, a, is, a, is an important matter, we're also talking about global competitiveness of this country. Where are we going to get the personnel to drive the work at a place like Woods Hole? And if you just look at who's in the, in the pipeline, predominantly women and growing with students of color. Some people project the students of color will be the majority of students in this country in the next couple of decades. And yet in those very groups, we continue to see underrepresentation. And so the work that you've started at Woods Hole is more than about social justice. It's about sustaining competitiveness. This is the Sankofa bird. <laughs> it's derived from the Akon people in West Africa. It's a mythical bird that flies forward while looking backward. Thus, for us to understand our present and ensure our future, we must know our past. And so therefore, I'm gonna spend some time today in gathering the best of what we can know about the past to, to try to get a sense of what the past is teaching us so that we can achieve our full potential going forward. In short, US global leadership in the STEM fields, which has benefited greatly from contributions of young scientists and women and people of color, and it must, we must intensify that. So I wanna just take a step backward during my presentation this afternoon 
and look backward at a few young scientists and persons of color who've made significant contributions that will give us a framework for understanding our, our demands for the future and our opportunities for the future. It's the cover of Time Magazine, 1953. Rosalind Franklin, who died at a very young age, at the age of, actually she was 37 at the time of her death. She lived, uh, she died in 1958. She was on the cover of Time Magazine. At the time, Time was doing a, the 100 Women of the Year. Now they do People of the Year. Rosalind Franklin was on the cover. Rosalind Franklin was a major, a major uh, person in the, uh, the uh, scientific work that led to the discovery of the double helix structure of DNA. She was 33 at the time. Uh, her X-ray crystallography was very important in the work that Crick and Watson reported. By the way, Watson was only 25 at the time. Again, thinking about young scientists. Watson, incidentally, without the controversy about Watson, I, I don't want to go into the, in this lecture, finished his undergraduate degree at the University of Chicago at 19, which means that some of the PEP fellows need to get moving. He, he was done at, at, at 19, and finished his doctorate at Indiana University, where I started my own academic career at the age of 23. And at the age of 25, he was doing the work with Crick and Watson that led to the discovery of double helix. And of course, the X-ray crystallography was critical in that work, uh, which was not acknowledged, by the way, by Crick and Watson in their original articles, who reportedly did not get her permission to use the X-rays. There's some controversy about that. But Rosalind Franklin died at age 38 before the Nobel Prize was awarded in 1963. And by that time, Watson was 35. And thus she did not get the Nobel Prize for her work, but the work that she did in X-ray crystallography was central to this work. She also contributed new insights on the structure of viruses, helping to lay the foundation for the field of structural virology. But this woman, this woman scientist, it's largely unknown to many for a scientific breakthrough that frankly revolutionized the biological sciences. I wanted to make sure that in the, to contextualize the contributions of both women and, and a young person that not only might have had, had a great contribution to science, but also kind of documents or kind of epitomizes the notion that women of color, women in general rather, have often been overlooked or minimized for their contributions in science. And one thing I would like to add in the context of all the mentors here today, and particularly with the with our with our PEP scholars, mentors of of, of a Watson, for example, at Chicago, in when he was nineteen, graduating. Probably would not have predicted this. You know, this guy is going to get a get a Nobel get a Nobel Prize for his work in six years. I would doubt if any faculty member would have said that, or a person on his dissertation committee when he finished at twenty three. They might have said he's a great guy, smart, brilliant, but likely to do right, likely to do the work that'll lead to a Nobel Prize in a couple of years. I don't think so. Uh, and, and certainly one that might have revolutionized biological sciences. And the same might have been, have been true for Rosalind Franklin. And so I say that, and I'll come back to it in a moment, that for the, I believe it's somewhere on the order of 17 PEP, or I don't know what do, you, what do you say, PEP or PEP scholars with you this year. There may be somebody in this group who's going to have a Nobel Prize in eight years. There could be another James Watson or, or Rosalind Franklin with you. As I'm sure, as I said before, I am sure. <laughs> I don't have the data for it, but I doubt I could say that. That any of the mentors of Rosalind Franklin or of, uh, of James Watson would have predicted that to have been the case. Here's another person. This is Lydia Via Komarov. 
third Mexican American to receive a doctoral degree in STEM, 1975. As a graduate student, as a graduate student, she co-founded the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos, Hispanics, and Native Americans in Science. Some of you know it as SACNAS. Leadership beyond her academic work, but was a part as but, but but as an activist student engaged in establishing a a, a, um, a space to advance Chicanos, Hispanics, and Native Americans in science. An undergraduate faculty advisor, by the way, and there's a lesson here, told her that women do not belong in chemistry. <laughs> so she switched her major. She switched it to biology. Learned, earned a PhD in biology at MIT at the age of 27, another young person getting an advanced degree. Three years later, three years later, after getting the, uh, earning the doctorate at MIT as a postdoc researcher in a Nobel laureate's lab, Walter Gilbert was the first author of a landmark paper that documented how bacterial cells could be in, induced to make pro-insulin the first time that a mammalian hormone was synthesized by bacteria. This research was a milestone piece of research and the birth of the biotechnology industry. Many people don't know that name. Another person making a significant contribution at a very young age. Is there another Lydia Via Kumara among the PEP fellows this summer? Who knows? You may recognize this person. This is Kismikia Corbett. Got a baccalaureate degree at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Not the University of Maryland, University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Not, not MIT. Not Caltech. Not UC Berkeley. Maryland, Baltimore County which by the way, produces more African-Americans today of any predominantly white institution in the country that graduates African-Americans who later get PhDs in STEM. We hear a lot about that, about that institution, particularly in the leadership of Freedom or Freeman Hrabowski. Remarkable institution, only 15,000 students, remarkable record. Dr. Corbett uh, received her doctorate two years later, 2014, at the University of North Carolina especially with immunology and microbiology, but she was the lead scientist at NIH on the COVID-19 vaccine research and development team. And in February, 2021, now seven years after receiving her PhD, Corbett was highlighted in Time Magazine's 100 Next under the category of innovators with a profile written by none other than Anthony Fauci. I wonder how many faculty at UMBC thought in 2008, <laughs> they, were, they had a young woman who was gonna do that kind of work. Again, for the mentors, you never know. You never know what people can do and therefore the kind of motivation you can provide for them. Dr. Darrells, I suspect you recognize this face. This is Kelly Mack. She's an alum of your institute of your institution. She's an alum of the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. When you were there, I believe it's called Maryland State University. She earned her PhD at Howard University at the age of 25 in physiology. I knew her as a graduate student. She joined the faculty of her alma mater, went back to the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, and she stayed there until the grand old age of 35, where she had, by the way, become full professor in that short time. And she, at, in, the, in the process, it conducted research at, in breast cancer at the Mayo Clinic. But before the age of 40, she was one of the earliest directors of the advanced program at the National Science Foundation to advance women in science. She became vice president of STEM undergraduate education at the American Association of Colleges and Universities, where she is now. She's been a PI and a co-PI of millions of dollars to support research and education to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion in STEM at the national level 
with a focus on undergraduates and people of color. Currently, I'm pleased to say that she and I are co-PIs on a major grant from the National Science Foundation called the Center for the Advancement of STEM Leadership that conducts STEM leadership research and professional development at the HBCU uh, community. A different kind of person, but again, every, all the people I'm telling you about, are people before 40, what they've contributed and the successes that they've had. Gentlemen, I just put on the screen, I'll show another one behind him, which is this one. The first gentleman is Everett uh, Joseph. Joseph and um, was, was a part of the team with uh, Boris that established the NOAA Center for Atmospheric Sciences at Howard University in 2003, again, before the age of 40. And I believe, Dr. Gerald, you'll know a little bit about this center because the number that NOAA recognized in the early, early 2000s that they needed to make a greater investment at the historically Black colleges and universities. They've made some investments at your alma mater, Maryland um, Eastern Shore, to advance marine biology. Uh, Joseph and Morris were involved in establishing atmospheric sciences at Howard at the doctoral level. They did this all before the age of 40. Today, that center that they created, Morris and Joseph, has graduated over half of all African Americans in the United States. <laughs> with PhDs in the atmospheric sciences and less than and slightly over, slightly under 20 years. Joseph has subsequently uh, led millions of dollars of research, about $90 million worth since that time. And he is now the director of NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder. This is work that someone did again, started work that, or the, the age of 40. And if you go to Vernon Morris, Morehouse College graduate, currently director of the School of Mathematical and Natural Science at the University of Arizona, he has mentored over 200 students in atmospheric science, students of color, Black, Latinx, and so on, and, and women. So these are just exemplars of people who have made great advances at, di at different platforms in their careers in STEM, some in laboratories, some in public policy, some in advocacy, but in general, they, they, they reflect the landscape of our future in science. And I would suspect that you all understand that the, that the program uh, the, with the young scholars at Woods Hole this summer represent people who are going to be the pictures we're using in a Gerald's lecture in a few years. And I hope all the students who are there today, all the scholars who are listening today, or in the room today, will see themselves in these examples. So what do we learn from these exemplars? First of all, we learned that there are clearly new players on the STEM horizon. Many are women, and or people of color, but as I'll show you in a moment, not enough of them. There are also new challenges and new questions and opportunities for the STEM enterprise to address. And this will always be the case. And that's something else that we learned. We, we will have these new challenges and, and these new questions to address. We'll have new technologies to emerge. And we'll continue to use these technologies so that it will hasten discovery and innovation. And at the same time, we learn from these examples of these exemplars that discovery and innovation is enhanced by a diverse scientific workforce, which includes new and young minds. Great science and mentors reside in diverse types of institutions. I do want you to note that. And if I could just I'll say a little bit about that again in a moment but they come from all kinds of places. And you, you'll see that in, in, in just a few minutes. They didn't all come from elite institutions to start. They came from diverse places and from diverse spaces in their professional lives. So we need to keep that in mind. We also note that multidisciplinarity 
and interdisciplinarity with hasten discovery and innovation. We think about the discovery of the vaccines, for example, that was example of work that cut across uh, geographical and political boundaries with laboratories in Europe and in the United States, for example, working around uh, one major scientific problem. We also see the interconnectivity with the social, behavioral, and the economic sciences and how they intersect with the physical and the biological sciences. And of course, we've seen that enhanced science communication enhances public understanding and utilization of scientific advances. One of the big issues we face with in COVID is trying to communicate to the general population about the nature of the pandemic, about the way of best approaches for safety. We have the political issues kicking in. And so the, the communication about science to wide audiences is a major imperative for all of us. I said a moment ago, I was gonna share something with you about where students, where, where the future resides. You may recall that I indicated to you that women constitute about 50, 57% close, would be 60% soon of American college students and people of color around 40% today. Just look at where, the, where, where these students are residing. And this chart, if you can see it, will tell you the baccalaureate origins, for example, of African Americans in the STEM disciplines. And it's focusing particularly on the, the proportion of them that had their undergraduate origins at HBCUs, historically black colleges. And if you just let me scroll, uh, take you down a bit, I don't want to put this, the Hispanic one up yet. If you could see this, look at geosciences, atmospheric sciences, and ocean sciences, and look at that, look at that. Almost 30%, almost 30% of all African Americans who later get doctorates in your fields at Woods Hole, they're not graduating from predominantly white institutions. 30%, and by the way, these institutions only enroll about 3% of African-Americans in the United States. I'm sorry, about 3% of all, of all students in the United States, about 9% of African-Americans. But in terms of the, of the the geosciences, the atmospheric sciences, and the ocean sciences, they're graduating 30%, which is an incredible number. So you look at, if you just look at the issue around where this talent resides, you can see that. If you go over and look at Hispanic focused institutions, same chart, almost 40%, almost 40% of all Hispanic or Latino doctorate recipients who later get, who, 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 if you look at their undergraduate origins, almost 40% came from highly Hispanic educational institutions. So you think about where talent resides. It's residing in places that are not always the places that we think of in terms of producing this, our workforce for the future. So what do we want our audience to remember today, particularly our, our scholars, our, I call them the fellows, but I'll say the scholars. I want you to remember the Sankofa bird, look backward while flying forward. In other words, keep a perspective on what has happened before you as a framework of what you can do going forward. You are going forward, but you're always mindful of the past. You certainly want, we certainly want you to be aware of the many opportunities that are available for you and that will be available for you on the horizon. The world needs your insights. They need your visions and your perspectives. And they need you to look at them through your own cultural lenses. For example, I can just think of one that comes to mind. If you look at the work that, that took place at the uh, GE, laboratories and the development of the, what's called the Cinegraph Pristina Mammography System, which is a system that was designed to provide more, more comfortable um, uh, technology for, for breast cancer, for, for mammograms in, in, in search for uh, uh, potential for breast cancer. 
The uh, Cinegraph Pristine was designed by a group of women at GE, GE Health. A name, Aurelie Boudier is the name of a group of women scientists who, who understood some of the discomfort often associated with mammograms, mammography, and who wanted to design a different kind of device that took into account the female anatomy and, and some of the anxiety that women sometimes report as um, engage, uh, receiving this um, uh, examination. And they produced this, what I call, what is called the Cinegraph Prestina mammography system. But it came through the lens of women who, un, who had a perspective and an understanding that male scientists might not have had. That's the point here, is that people can ask questions, this design methodologies for understanding them. They can look at questions through their own lenses, and they might look at them through their own social and cultural perspectives, and they may come up with a different outcome. So that's another reason why we need to have diversity in the scientific community, not just to check a box, and not just for to show that we we have a diverse workforce but also for people who can ask perhaps different kinds of questions or, dev or devise different types of methodologies or analyze data a different way. That will lead us to further discovery and innovation. For many of the student, uh, students, of uh, uh, scholars here, we, we need you to consider careers as STEM faculty. That's also important. We need many of you to get your doctorate so that you can produce a new generation of scientists we want you to also to consider engaging in advocacy work and policy that is also important for our nation. But all of you must consider graduate education. I know I've looked at the list of the, the, the scholars, the, your sophomores, juniors, a couple of seniors, but I want all of you to consider strongly pursuing graduate degree, preferably through the doctorate to maximize your potential and contributions to society. And all of you must continue to commit to a lifetime of continuing questioning and learning, because if you think about it, the amount of known information in the universe is doubling, tripling daily, not daily, but in very short periods of time. And what we know today in a few years may be obsolete. So you can be a part of that discovery of new knowledge and new perspectives. What is it, what's in this for the mentors? One, never understand, underestimate what students might achieve just years from your laboratories. I've given you a number of examples today from Rosalind Franklin to, to um, Kelly Mack and others, but never underestimate what your students might achieve just years from your laboratories. Don't us to underestimate the potential of students from non-elite undergraduate institutions. And I made that point earlier when I gave you the example of the undergraduate origins of African-Americans acquiring the doctoral degree. So don't underestimate the potential of students who come from places like UMES, University of Maryland Eastern Shore, or Savannah State College, or Morehouse College, or the University of Texas El Paso. I know what is one of your postdocs has been there. Don't underestimate the potential of students from those types of institutions. Don't presume that students can only get quality doctoral training at top ranked research universities. I'm thinking about the work of our, that we did at Howard University in atmospheric sciences and, and the quality of the work that they have done and continue to do postgraduate. So you can't presume that students of, quality, of, of, of competence and who can make significant contributions can only come from top ranked institutions. But I wanna urge mentors to be open to new research questions and methodologies that arise from the cultural experiences and perspectives of of our of fellows or scholars and colleagues from diverse backgrounds. Don't dismiss research that might arise from lesser known journals. Another issue is I don't have the time to go into the details of that about implicit bias that occurs in, in um, editors and reviewers for publications. And you're finding increasingly more and more publication sources and more and more publication outlets that many scholars, particularly young scholars and scholars of, con of color, can, uh, su uh, submit their work. And don't presume that leadership in STEM can only arise from a laboratory. 
Think about, again, our honoree, Dr. Ambrose Gerald. Think about the contributions that he made beyond the laboratory. So be careful what you say to students and the presumption you make about their possibilities. Again, I'm thinking about uh, Rosalind Franklin or James Watson, uh, uh, the, the example of someone being told, don't, don't major in chemistry. So be careful what you say to students and the presumption you make about their possibilities. So in closing, and I see our time is about up, I wanna close with two statements by two scholars who published a paper through the, at the University of Chicago, Armin and Dietrich. Dreamers imagine and articulate newness, theories, models, methods, practices, or applications of science that represent change of kind, not just degree. And another quote from their work, these changes are not revisions or refinements of an existing feature of a field. They are original additions that extend beyond what had constituted the boundary of the field and are often the result of making daring, surprising connections between them. So with that, I wanna thank you all for your time. And I think I have about 10 minutes for comments or questions or alternate perspectives. So again, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, that was fantastic. I'll remind if anyone on Zoom would like to post a question in the chat, please do so. Do we have any questions from people in the room as well? I will start with a question that is in the chat. Uh, it's a little bit long, but it's um, given the cost of college education and limited paid internships or jobs to fund excessive costs resulting in a load of debt after graduation, how can STEM students be supported with scholarships, seasonal research grants, rising cost of living and shortage of workers? Many current biological science students take pre-med studies rather than STEM studies as future professional careers. Well, you, you raise, that's a very challenging question because cost is a factor. And there, there are two answers I have. Number one is continued advocacy for federal, state, local governments to invest in STEM and STEM education in particular, making sure that we are active in the political system to urge our elected officials to, to value support for higher education, particularly in STEM. Also, uh, a number of philanthropists have stepped forward to make uh, donations to advance uh, science at various institutions. And some of them have recognized the importance of the minority serving institutions and given significant dollars for, for those purposes. So I think that's another important uh, dimension to get more philanthropic support. And then another option would be the, a search for collaborations between industry and federal agencies in terms of providing research internships like your summer program, which presume not only provides uh, intellectual and research uh, development, but also I'm certain provides a level of financial support for the students who are there for the summer. So again, those, those are just some examples, but the issue of cost cannot be, understated, cannot be overstated because you're talking about people who are coming from the lower echelon of the economic system, who've just finished four years of college, may have great debt from loans already. And then they're talking about another four to five years of pursuing a doctorate or more than you talk about really pushing down the likelihood of success. So I think we have to have all hands on debt. We have to really make finding the financial support for uh, uh, graduate education in STEM a priority. And I read about a number of institutions who, who raised millions of dollars through capital campaigns I don't see enough in those capital campaigns saying that, that are earmarked for supporting of students of color and women to in, in science. I think that's something we need to to do in, in trying to and uh, uh, to communicate that that demand or that that priority to leaders of higher education institutions. 
Thank you, Dr. Taylor. We do have another really good question. Do you have suggestions for how to connect aspiring scientists of color with established scientists of color without overburdening those particular mentors? Yeah, that's a very, a very difficult question, if I understand it uh, correctly. You're speaking about how to connect uh, young scholars with scientists who have strong reputations and who are very active. Is that, is that the question, basically, that you've asked? Yes, being I think asked? So. Mm -hmm. One approach might well be is to identify, and I think you might have done this, some of this already at Woods Hole, I'm not sure. But if, if we could identify a cadre of scientists around the country who really are committed to advancing inclusion in scientific fields and have them as a kind of a, a consortium of scientists who will agree to take students in their labs, put them on their grants uh, to, to support their academic interests. We may be, it would be a very exciting thing. Suppose we could find 50 ocean scholars or 50 atmospheric scholars in various places in the country who say, I'm committed to this and I will set aside scholarships and fellowships for graduate students to come to my lab to work. And we know who they are and we can do a matching uh, process whereby hopefully we can identify students with those kinds of interests with, with faculty members and scientists who have those commitments so that they can pursue their work. So that may be one thing that could come out of uh, our discussion. That's a fantastic idea. I love that. Well, thank you, Dr. Taylor. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, this lecture was fantastic. We are going to find a way to get you here in Woods Hole to be able to meet everyone and spend some time here with us. I and mean, I want to say a special thank you to Val and Matt at Hui for hosting this through the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and to the Marine Biological Laboratory for hosting us in this room. Thank you all again for joining us today. This lecture will, is recorded and will be on our website shortly. And we look forward to seeing you all at next year's Ambrose Gerald Jr. Lecture. Thank you. And Dr. Taylor, um, we're going to get off this soon.